um, yes, I'm presenting from Karingai land today. So I acknowledge the original custodians and I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, We've been looking after this beautiful land for a very long time. Um, I'm, I'm presenting on behalf of um, a whole team, so um, I'd like to acknowledge also Louise Ellis, Kate Chiruka and Geoffrey Braithwaite. And I'm from the Australian Institute of Health Innovation at Macquarie University. There we go. Um, so we do health systems research. Um, now health systems have got huge numbers of stakeholders. We're looking at sophisticated treatments, um, lots of new technology, regulations and rules to follow, and it's an ever-changing environment. So just to sum it up, the delivery of healthcare is incredibly complex. Um, and not just complex, it is really complex. So this is a diagram which I love. It's from a paper which, um, which looks at processes that actually graphically um, depicted the processes, not in the whole health system, not even in, the, in a whole hospital, but just in one emergency department. So you can see just how, how complex these things are. And of course, the, we do a lot of work on how to deliver healthcare that is of high quality, um, keeps patients safe, and as you probably all know, because you're in this field, um, there's, there are intractable problems where we just can't seem to get that, that um, adverse event um, incidents down. Uh, there's, there's always room for improvement. And in studying all of this, um, it's very important that we look at social processes. So what are the social processes in healthcare? Well, there's... Um, uh, communication is a big one. So um, communication when you're handing over from one, one group of clinicians to the next shift. So nurses do that every day. Um, transfers from one department to another. You need to make sure that the um, information goes with the patient. Discharges when someone's leaving a hospital and going back to under the care of their GP perhaps. Um, and referrals when you're passing on to another expert team. Communication is, is a social process and very important. Learning is also a social process. So any sort of hands-on learning, you're learning from one another, um, you're learning by asking questions and by actually doing it, that's a social process. And finding advice, you can't Google everything you need to know if you're a clinician. Um, so it's very important that you know who to go to to find out um, good advice. There's also the need for social support, practical support, working in teams and collabor collaboration across different groups. So how can you study social processes? Well, one way is to consider healthcare as a network of people. So we know that networks, no matter whether they are a train network, a transport network, um, computer networks and network of veins in your hands or neurons in your brain, um, computer networks or, or people, um, there are mathematical um, associations that hold true over any sort of network and that's a very useful way to view it. So what is a social network? So the definition is that it's a set of people who we call actors, who have some form of tie or relationship between them. So you have to have at least two actors to make a network um, and it can go up into the millions. But here's an example. So Chris and Raj, um, they're friends. So they're, they have a relationship of friendship that they socialize together. Um, one may send a, an email to the other. That's a different type of relationship. Um, and it doesn't have to be verbal, it could actually be a contagion network. So Chris could give a cold to Raj, hopefully not COVID, but this is the basis of all the contact tracing as well. Also, you can have groups of people who are the unit of analysis. So um, you might, for example, look at the relationship of one hospital to another. So you collect all the data and then you map it in a thing called a sociogram. So each node is a person um, and 
a line between them represents the relationship. So for example, here, if you're interested in how patient information is shared in Ward B, you could collect data from all the staff um, and map it. So you can see that um, the senior nurse here is very involved in the sharing of information, but the physio doesn't seem to be in the loop at all, quite literally. Um, and if you ask a different question, you get a different network. So um, if, you, if you mapped the data that was on friendships on Ward B, then you can see it's it looks totally different. So it's very important that you get the wording of the question right. So what's social network studies good for? Well, it's very good at identifying gaps in communications. So um, this, is a, this was a group of um, a study that where we did on people with very complex needs who were living in the community and how um, community nurses and um, occupational, community occupational therapists provided care for them. Um, and so we asked them, who, what person would you go to if you needed to seek advice, if you were uncertain how to care for your client? And this is what the nurses and OTs responded with, who they would go to. Now, the thing to note here is these little upturned, um, these little triangles here, they were actually the specialist coordination nurses um, who we, they were trying everyone, they were trying to get everyone to communicate with them and get advice from them because they had all the knowledge and um, were able to fast track admissions and so forth. And you can see that there's a lot of people that were linked in with them, um, but there were some people that were completely out of the loop again, and um, there were various gaps here. So that was really useful to very quickly get a lot of information about that. This is a different one. Um, social network studies are really good at identifying bottlenecks and inefficiencies in processes and to make a case for change. Um, so this was a large trial that was recruiting patients from across Australia. Um, we collected data on the consultation network using a survey. And they were using new technology, new processes. They were working across departments that hadn't worked before. So it was very, very complex. Many people were seeking advice and making decisions together, um, but the communication was pretty ad hoc to start with. So we mapped the consultation network um, of, this, of this big trial, which was going to go forward into routine practice. And you can see that P108 and P132, those two individuals were the ones that were getting, copying all the inquiries, um, being asked to give advice an awful lot. Um, so that resulted in us suggesting that they build up a case for change, um, a case for all of this unseen and unpaid work be actually integrated into their job description so that um, they weren't working till you know, all hours of the night trying to get through all their work. Um, and also if there was a way that we could put frequently um, asked questions on, online so that they didn't have to actually take phone calls on those. Another really good um, use for social network studies is the evaluation of interventions. Um, so here is a, um, where we've mapped the growth of collaboration between universities, hospitals and consumers. Um, and you're looking at the intervention of a translational research network. And, um, this was used, and you can clearly see that they started out small and then they grew and they grew. And these links, which are depicting actual collaborations between people, just became more and more dense. So that was a very successful um, network. And this was actually, these diagrams were used in the rebid for more funding. So ethical considerations, there are five that I'm going to go through. So first of all, confidentiality. So Steve Bogatti, who's one of the gurus in social network research, says, talks about the impossibility of anonymity in the social network survey. Um, you have to know who you're talking about and names are the only efficient and practical identifiers. So um, you need to know who's filling out the survey and you also need to know 
who they're talking about when they say they have a relationship with them. Um, sometimes you just need to, if you don't know, like that previous, previous one, we actually knew who was in the network. We actually had a list of, of um, 300 people there, I think. Um, if you don't know who's in the network, you might use a different format where you ask people to write in the names of their, um, of their links and um, hopefully with enough detail that I can work out who they are when we aggregate the data. The other thing about confidentiality is that unlike collecting a whole lot of variables, which you're going to you know, run statistics on and come up with a, an average of, of all the respondents or the, you know, the standard deviation and the, and the mean, et cetera, um, you're actually mapping the raw data. So in this example, every single dot there is a respondent. Um, so sometimes you can actually work out who is where you are in the in the um, in the network and also who different people must be oh that must be Mary for example in this case actually the um, it was easy to work out who this person was and that person was really keen to be named because um, that her whole brief was to increase collaboration and it showed how effective she was at doing that when you're dealing with much higher numbers, of course, um, it's, it's much easier to keep that confidentiality. And, and as you can see here, we're not using names, we're using um, codes. Now, another ethical consideration is about non-participants. So if Jill nominates Sue, but Sue doesn't do the survey, do you include Sue or not? Um, so leaving Leaving Sue out is disrespectful to Jill because that's Jill's participation. It's her data, but leaving out, um, leaving her in may reveal something about Sue that Sue doesn't want known. Um, so there's always this, this complicated juggling of do you leave them out or in? But if you do leave them out, then that leads to uh, another headache for researchers because it's um, missing data is a big deal in social network surveys. So the intention is to get data on the whole network. It's a census, not a sample, and you need the response rate to be as close as possible to 100%. Um, so if you're studying the flow of crucial information in the unit and you've got missed out a few people, you could end up with something that's not the whole network and you could make completely the wrong conclusions. And appropriate access, um, you usually need to go through managers um, to access health um, professionals, get them to issue the invitation and circulate the link. And because it's coming from the manager, sometimes respondents want to look good. So there's the element of social desirability, or oh, I'm going to write down that I work with everybody. Um, I'm a good employee. Um, or there may be people that go, oh my gosh, I'm not going to, this is going to make me look really bad. I don't want to do this. Um, high response rate too, sometimes you get a bit overzealous because you you keep sending out reminders because you want to get that response rate up um, and then you end up with um, perceptions of coercion, which is also not good. So what should, what should um, ethics committees look for in a social network analysis? Well, researchers really need to make the case that, that they need to use social network analysis. Um, a question that can be answered in another way is um, it, you shouldn't be doing social network analysis because, it's, because of all these ethical difficulties. The survey needs to be designed really carefully. You need to understand, as a researcher, you need to understand the context, the boundaries of the network, who's in, who's out. The exact wording of the question needs to be piloted. They need to do a lot of work um, in that initial area. You need to also assess will they get enough buy-in because it's going to be um, uh, because it's a whole network. Um, so the research questions or aims that get the best buy-in are things that are, are really obvious to the group that they're going to be beneficial. So um, I haven't actually had much problem with um, with getting buy-in at least from the most active people in the in the networks that I've studied um, because everyone can see that wow, this is actually something we need to, to prove. 
uh, sorry, there's something we need to improve. Um, and you need to be really upfront about um, confidentiality, how they're going to manage the, um, the management plan, showing the um, having a session with, with the network, if you can, with all the people that are going to participate, just explaining what you're going to do so that it's you sort of demystify it a bit is really useful. And a very important thing is make sure that they do a feedback session, um, even if it's only to the, the, um, the management, because um, they're so useful in triggering reflections on how you're going as a network and what you can improve. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, Paula.